people just kind of walking around uh, the, with the exhibitors and listening to conversations, there was, there was a lot of, geez, I didn't know that. I, you know, I'm learning. I'm getting overwhelmed. Uh, what do I do next? Richard just gave you one answer. It's coming, coming and joining us and attending our, big, our bigger programs. But the one thing that you have to appreciate, we were all there at some point. We were all there. And it just took some of us longer to realize what we didn't know. And you have to also appreciate that your present, your present circumstances don't necessarily determine where you can go. They determine where your new starting point is. So your new starting point is today. And Dr. John Yu is going to take us a little bit further. And he's going to go actually back before we go forward. And he's going to help us understand some of the underlying reasons why we see what we see. The first time I met Dr. Yu, Professor Yu was at what, one of Dr. Han's uh, programs in California. And I was just blown away. Like it was empirically, you're looking at your patients and you know there's something wrong. You just don't know what to do about it. Once you see something that Professor Yu is going to talk about, I like to say that we can't get stupid again. Once you've seen it, you can't go back. And now that's going to send you down a new journey. That's why, from this point on, you've got a new starting point. So please, let's welcome Professor John Yu, and let's have a wonderful morning. Thanks very much. You're very welcome. Do you need some help? I don't know. I think I'm all right. It's, it's quite a long way up. So, whoops. There we are. Um, God, what fun it is getting old. Anyway, um, yes, I've got quite a difficult task here. Where did I need that button thing that advances it? Because someone gave me one. Just use. Ah, yes, you're there. Great, one of these great, great assets. Um, right, let me do this. Uh, no, that's it. Anyway, um, it starts off, that's just a slide full of writing, but just starts off by saying I've got a difficult job because most of you don't really know what orthotropics is at all. And most, I should say quite a lot of you have a, a good idea of what it's to do with, but it is different. It's actually different from any other form of dental treatment I have ever come by across before. Marco, I'm talking a little bit in the past tense because for the last 30 years there have been a lot of people doing it. But before that, really, I was the only one. I was lucky to be brought up in a university where my personal professor was very keen on functional orthodontics. He taught me a lot about the functional appliances of the day the most advanced being the monoblock. Many of you might have heard of it, a lot of you won't have. But it was just a large block, um, in those days, a vulcanite. I'm very old, remember. Um, uh, and because of that, you know, they had to be built up in bits of vulcanite and then compressed, which is the way they did vulcanite. And it was a single block that you put in the mouth, but, but you, it was made to a protrusive bite. In other words, the mandible was held forward. And that was what its intention was, to bring the mandible forward. It was based on research by a guy called Robin, a Frenchman, who was using something similar um, for patients back in 1910. So quite a long time back. Um, uh, I started treatment in, um, doing treatment in 1950, long before many of you were born. But there we are. Um, now, I, the clock's gone round in many different ways, and I, I'm anxious to, to get across as much as I can about orthotropics in the short time I have today. Um, <laughs> Clearly, it is a very complex treatment. I actually think it's considerably more difficult and complex 
than any form of orthodontic treatment, but I'm talking primarily of fixed orthodontic treatment. Orthodontists might not agree, but that's my opinion. It is certainly an easy treatment to do badly, but a very difficult treatment to do well. Essentially, it's based on the belief, and I'm not going to have much time to talk about the basics of this, but the belief of orthotropics, which occurred to me back in the late 60s, early 70s, is that the reason so many people grow up with mouth-shaped jaws is because of our oral posture. Now, that is a different approach. Most people are used to the term functional. But function, if you know the definition, is movement. Posture is not movement. This is posture. It's the position of the tongue, the lips, and the jaw, which I, and I think most orthotropists, believe controls the growth of the maxilla and mandible and the development of the dentition. Just remember that, the position of the tongue, lips and jaws, that is all there is to orthotropics. All right, there's how to change it and what to do about it, but that's really the more practical side. The theory is just, it's a postural deformity. The same way as you can get with backs and other parts of the anatomy if you posture in the wrong position for long periods of time. So, as I say, it's a simple concept. But, as you might quickly realize, changing posture is far more difficult than changing function or, indeed, moving teeth. Um, we all know it's relatively easy to move teeth. They respond to gentle long-term posture. Um, but long-term force, I should say, which is posture, of course. Um, so, I developed a system which basically took account of that and was run on the basis of um, changing posture. Now, it is very difficult to do this. And, um, in fact, an awful lot of people who have heard me lecture look at the slides and say, gosh, that's a good system, it gets nice results. And I hope you'll say the same when I show you a few slides. But of course that can easily beguile them into thinking it's a fairly straightforward thing to achieve. It's not. It's very difficult to achieve for two reasons. One, it's difficult to change posture, that I'm talking from the clinician's angle, very difficult to change someone else's posture. And the second problem is that, of course, it entirely depends on the child, or I should say patient's, ability to change and maintain a different posture. If they can do that, you win and get a lovely result. If you can't, you fail. Now, in effect, I'm saying, and this was what I pronounced in 1968, that all malocclusion is due to malposition of the tongue, lips, or jaws. And I founded at that time a theory, in fact it was a proposition, called the tropic premise. Tropic meaning position. Um, uh, and premise meaning the concept. And I based then a treatment which I call orthotropics, which means correct growth um, uh, guided by correct posture. It's a Greek um, word, or they are Greek words, and the, the translation isn't exactly that, but that's the name we have adopted, orthotropics, and I think it is a good description of what we do. Uh, but of course, um, having thought of the theory, um, I then had to try and find ways of correcting posture. And I spent, the biggest problem is training children to keep their mouths shut. And uh, nearly everything else is a lot easier. You also need to control the tongue. You can do that with oral biology, but everybody I know who tries it agrees with me that it is exceedingly difficult to change tongue posture. 
Now, many of you aren't even aware of where your tongues are. They should, according to the tropic premise, all be stuck up on the palate. And um, really, when I say stuck on it, I mean that. It should suck with uh, an actual positive suction. There should be negative air pressure about between your tongue and the soft tissue of your palate. Your tongue should not touch the teeth. Now, I know that most of you in this room um, don't comply with that. I am, from my experiments, I found out that about 98% of people have the wrong posture. That basically only leaves 1% or 2% that actually keep their tongue in their palate. You can all see immediately who they are because they're outstandingly good looking. It's just very, very rare. Now, I, I hate to say this, it's a somewhat delicate matter, but I think therefore all of you are deformed, except those, that odd 2%. That's just how I read it. What I don't think most of us realize is just how different we are from the original, our original predecessors. And that's what I'm going to talk about just a little bit. But my main emphasis today is that, that there are many, many ways of changing posture. I spent years developing this technique, I mean years. The actual stage three appliance, don't worry about what it is, it's an appliance which clips in the upper jaw and has two extensions running down into the mandible, uh, down each side of the tongue. Um, it's designed so that the child will be trained to keep their mouth shut. And it does that by being comfortable when the mouth is shut, but uncomfortable in any other position. So the big advantage of this is that it trains the child themselves to close their mouth. If they happen to have an overjet or say the mandible is set back, you posture them with it set forward. But it is not, the mandible isn't held forward by the wires or the appliance. The mandible is held forward by the patient because that is the only comfortable position. That makes a huge difference. Functional appliances, you clip into the upper jaw and when you close it pulls the lower jaw forward. And they're very widely used. But if you think about it, remember the laws of Newton, every force has an equal and opposite force. So a functional appliance will always retract the upper. And um, there is plenty of evidence to show that, remembering that it should be going forward anyway, so there may not be an active displacement back, but there certainly is a reduction in the normal forward growth of the maxilla. Now, the longer I thought about this, the more I realized that most of us, and certainly when I trained in functional appliances, I thought that my job was to get the mandible to come forward. If you have an overjet, clearly the mandible should be further, further forward. But when I actually studied the patients, and especially their skulls and teeth, I found that patients with big overjets, the maxilla is further back than the, the other patients. Now, that doesn't seem to make sense, does it? Why should the maxilla be back when they've got an overjet? Well, the answer is it's not quite like we expect. If this is a normal dentition, we think that an overjet is either like this or maybe like that and this, and that's how you have an overjet. But when I actually started measuring the skulls and looking at what was happening, that wasn't what was happening. Um, when you have an overjet, this is what happens. Both jaws come down, but the mandible swings back. And that is what causes the overjet. It's nothing to do with the maxilla being too forward, and not so much to do about the mandible being too far down. The problem is, once you've gone from here to there, how do you get back? Now, many people try to get back by just doing this. You know, many people use functional appliances in the belief that this happens. This doesn't happen. If you actually study what happens, this happens. 
The mandible goes, it already should be here, but it is here. When you fit a functional plans, it comes further down, but the lower jaw comes forward a little bit, not much, and down. And that is what causes the functional plants to reduce the overjet. But clearly, in my mind, that wasn't what I felt we should be achieving. We should try and tackle the patient down here and get them up there. But is that possible? That was really the challenge I set myself. And it really did take me 15, 20 years just to work out how to keep the mouth shut. I mean, either I'm stupid, but what, it isn't totally me because nobody else seems to have done it either. But basically, I think nobody really looked at what had gone wrong and decided how they should get it back, with the result that most orthodontists just fiddle around with the jaws here, maybe taking teeth out, maybe fitting functional appliances, whatever they're doing, when the jaws should be up here anyway. And so, there's a huge gap between what we are doing and perhaps what we should be doing. And that's really the nub of the concept of orthotropics. It isn't only the posture of the, of the lower jaw, it's also the posture of the tongue. That has a huge effect. I, people think the tongue, you know, how can that affect it? I, when I trained in orthodontics, I had a textbook that was, I think, 11 and a half hundred pages long. It was, you know, this thick. And in the whole of the book, the word tongue didn't appear. And that was supposed to tell me everything about the orthodontics, its cause, and, and how to treat it. And I feel it didn't really start because it didn't mention the tongue. Now, the tongue, because it's there all the time, does over time have a huge difference. It will totally control the position of the maxilla from being right up here to right back here. Um, and that is its main effect. It also, of course, controls the position of the upper teeth. Now, most of you in this room, your tongue is now touching your teeth. It should never touch the teeth. Um, one might say, well, why is everybody wrong? And there I think we have to start talking or thinking about lifestyle. Because our ancestors had remarkably straight teeth. And uh, I've done a lot of long-term research. And my particular interest is in skulls between 1,300 and 13,000, sorry, and 18,000 years ago. About 18,000 years ago, our species of man, of human, was established. Prior to that, even 19, 20,000 years ago, there were a lot of other similar animals to us who weren't the same. You all know such people uh, as um, the Homo man, the, um, the various, what was the other one? Neanderthal. Neanderthal, that's one. It's good to have your son po um, cribbing you on your way around. Anyway, there were several different Cro-Magnon and several others, all of whom were very similar, but they weren't the same. All of us in the room, um, dis despite whatever country we come from, have basically the same genes. There are minute differences, but the differences are tiny. And the differences in our face are huge. Why is that? Now, again, the research has all been done. We should all know that. If you study twins and um, uh, uh, look at variations in their growth, you'll find that um, the difference in the bones of identical twins is very, very small, all except one area. What do you think that is? You should know. It's this bit. That bit of the face is far more variable, and I mean 10, 20 times more variable than any other part of the skeleton. Why is that? This is something that we should all know. It's all written down. It's all there for you to look at. But most people ignore it. 
they just think, well, faces grow different. You look like your mother or your father or whatever. Um, or the milkman, as we should say. Anyway, um, these, um, these differences have to be um, there because the genetic control of growth is not that precise. It's not able to ensure that 32 teeth all mesh perfectly. The genes just aren't that detailed or clever. Therefore, we had to evolve so that our jaws and teeth grew into the position that we went into normally. And that, of course, represents our resting posture. So your jaws and tongue, everybody else's jaws and tongue, grow to the position you keep them. And if you keep your tongue on your palate, your lips together, and uh, your teeth in contact, and we think it's somewhere between four and eight hours a day, then your dentition and your face will grow perfectly. And there are other spin-offs. Not only won't you have any malocclusion, you won't have any disclusion, you won't have any sleep apnea, you won't have any TMD problems, and all your occlusal problems will dis dis disappear. Now, it sounds too simple, doesn't it? But that's what happened in ancient man. And uh, I've done a lot of um, digging up in various different places and looking at these people. There are surprisingly few um, men or women, the skulls, surviving from 15, 18,000 years ago. Very, very few. Most of them that have survived have been those who've had a very privileged upbringing and have been buried in special burial sites. Um, that has enabled us to recover their skulls relatively undamaged. But that has actually skewed research. Because as you might imagine, um, people of many years ago who lived a very privileged life tended to have a different lifestyle from the general um, guy living in the cave down the road. Um, and so they were much more likely to have, and indeed did have, high levels of malocclusion. The people you really needed to know about were those who weren't buried ceremoniously, but you'll find um, dug up at the bottom of a rubbish heap. They're the ones that actually tell you what ancient people looked like, and they didn't have malocclusion. Let me show a few slides because it will help me a bit. Um, I'm then going to talk a little bit more about um, uh, the causes and what goes wrong, and I'll try and spend a bit of time talking about what we can do to make it right. I'm just going to flip through a few slides here, if I can get through them in the necessary time. This is really saying what I'm taking now, um, and so I will, I said, right, this is uh, the skull, oh, I didn't press that one. Oh, I know what's happening, it's catching up for all the ones I've pressed. Let's see what happens. There we are. No, I'm still, oh dear, right. I think I've got there now, haven't I? Yep, seems stable. Now, outlined there, you can see the dentition. Um, now, that's um, um, it's just giving the outlines of the dentition. If I now isolate that and then compare it with a European. Now, this isn't a European, it's an average of 1,500 Europeans. Can you notice any difference? It's pretty huge, isn't it? I mean, and basically, that's what's happened to our faces, you know, to a greater or lesser extent. And we, all of us, have suffered increasing vertical growth, and as a result, of course, the mandible being hinged, if it drops down, it automatically moves back. The maxilla doesn't move back, the maxilla just moves down. And that's why you tend to get overjets appearing, because it doesn't go back so much as the mandible. But all that is pretty obvious when you start to think about it. So we will now start catching up with that. 
is a skull that I was involved with. I didn't dig it up myself. But um, and it was only 11,000 years ago, you might say relatively recent. But it was interesting in that it was fairly well preserved. The trouble with all skulls that old is that they tend to get smashed up. And the maxilla is the weakest part of the skull, and it tends to get smashed up most. But as you can see, we have a reasonable representation there. You can see the condyle on the mandible has gone. But you can roughly guess where the relationships were. Now, it was in um, a cave called Goth's Cave down in Somerset. And um, the guys that actually dug it up, as I say, it wasn't me. Um, they did um, an analysis and found they got some DNA out of one of the root canals on the teeth. Um, so they checked it and found it was very, very similar to all of you in here. Um, and out of a, just a passing interest, they thought, well, let's compare it with some of the locals. So they did. And they found a man in the village who had exactly the same DNA and was clearly a direct descendant of this guy from... I think it was a guy from 11,000 years ago. But basically, it just shows how immobile the English are. And, um, <laughs> and um, you know, how stable our populations are. And I'm sure you're, you're a much more mobile society over here. But the changes in DNA um, are very, very small. So don't look for changes in DNA for the etiology of the malocclusions you see around you. I, they don't exist. Malocclusion is an, an environmental problem. It is a question of lifestyle. And we just live, I won't say the wrong lifestyle, I'll say a different lifestyle from our ancestors. And most of you would prefer to live your present lifestyle than sit in a cave all day. Um, so uh, that gives a picture. Well, I, I actually took this a little bit further, and um, I drew a picture of what I thought man should look like. That's in a large picture there. Now, um, we haven't time, I'm afraid, to go into it in detail, but you, I expect, most of you who are interested in natural skull x-rays, um, accept Steiner's standard, which was um, uh, that the SNA angle should be 82, maybe 82 and a half degrees. I, I assume nearly all of you know what SNA angles are. Um, most of you would think that correct. Now, Steiner developed that on the basis of few of his better looking students in his um, college. And that's the, the only scientific basis for that. Um, it is, in fact, in my opinion, a long way post-normal of what we should be. If you treat to Steiner's analysis, you will find your patients have very flat, like really flat cheeks, um, uh, and uh, quite a bit of vertical growth. And I think that's quite wrong. Now, you all know, I imagine, Jim, Jim McNamara um, from Michigan. Um, he agrees with me, and he put the um, SNA about 10 degrees further forward. And that's a lot, 10 degrees in, in the skull. But I actually dif disagree with Jim. I've looked at his skulls, his tracings, and I think he underestimated it. I think the SNA angle should be 98, maybe 99, certainly coming up for um, 20 degrees further forward. Now, that is a massive contrast. I'm saying that of most of you in this room will be not far off that um, um, 82 degree or SNA, but most of you should therefore be best part of 20 millimeters further forward, your upper jaw. Then you'd have really good cheekbones. You'd also have plenty of room for 32 teeth. And if you kept your mouth shut as well, your mandible will be up there and will grow forward to that same position. And that, I believe, is what the human face should look like. But so few of us look like it 
But we don't have that image in our mind. We treat patients with the image of what everybody looks like now. But it is wrong, severely wrong. I'm being perhaps too specific there because life is full of values. But I'm saying that the modern facial profile is wrong. It's best part of 20 millimeters back from where it should be. Now, I can, did actually get an artist to confirm that for me, and that's what we should look like. I didn't just go put up a girl because I prefer girls, but girls have the advantage that they don't have beards, and therefore you can actually see the shape of their face. But that is more or less what I think modern man-stroke woman should look like. And of course, look at the cheekbones. Why do you see them so much? Because the maxilla is further forward. The cheekbones, as you know, are part of the maxilla. And um, we all know the good-looking faces have good cheekbones. Um, not many patients who've had four bias extracted have good cheekbones. And um, that, that really set me the, the standard with which I felt I ought to be treating. It wasn't enough just to straighten the teeth and find room for maybe 28 teeth. I felt that if we wanted to get it right, we had to get the face to grow forward and find room for 32 teeth. And my challenge, not my challenge, but my objective in every patient is to find plenty of room for 32 teeth. Now, it does horrify me a little bit that in our, I should use the word, complacency, most of us think, well, wisdom teeth, what are they? They're not really worthwhile. We'll remove them. Well, now, you may not think that matters very much, but I should think the patients would prefer not to lose them. And um, there should be plenty of room for your wisdom teeth. And um, so, um, now, someone very kindly put out a timer. That's telling me how long I've taken, or? How long you've got left. Yes, I've got an hour left. Oh, good, I can bore you a lot more. <laughs> and um, so, that is the type of face I'm aiming to produce. And uh, it, it's, it depends on the age of the child because um, I got dug into lots of research in trying to set this up. And there's no doubt that after the age of eight, it gets progressively more difficult to move the maxilla forward. Now, some of you won't like that age because many of you don't get it to your patients till much older. But the reality is you can move the maxilla forward after that age, but you've got to use quite heavy forward pull, and you have to use a special way of expanding the maxilla to loosen its attachment from the rest of the skull. And that's, of course, what I think is necessary. Um, but let's just move on. Um, now, this is uh, just my illustration of the change in the generations as, as we have adopted a Western lifestyle. This is a rather lovely, large, nice Sikh who was the grandfather of a patient of mine. And he used to bring the patient in. Um, he has a lovely face. His nose is slightly large. His face is slightly flat, which brings me to a point. Nobody in this room has a large nose. Some of you may think you have, but nobody has a large nose. What you may have is a retruding maxilla. Just think about it. Anyway, I'll continue. Um, his son, who is actually a, a dentist in the UK, looks a little flatter. Definitely um, a flat maxilla there. And you can see that because of the, of the vertical growth, his mandible has swung back a bit. But that's what happens to mandibles, isn't it? They're hinged. And if you drop them down, they've only got one place to go, back and they do that, which is really the origin of the um, class two malocclusion. So the, he came in because he's um, brought in his son. Now he'd been diagnosed with um, um, macrognathia, and um, he'd been told that the only solution was to wait till he was 18 when they would correct it with surgery. 
Well, now, at a, at, you know, at that young age, a pretty nasty prognosis to be told you've got to wait till you're 18 and then have... A, and it isn't minor surgery. I don't know if you know. I actually trained as an orthognathic surgeon myself. That was my original entry into orthodontics. I was spending my time sawing the mandibles in half and from time to time dislocating the maxillae and moving them forward. Now, an interesting thing, nearly all the max fat people move the maxilla forward and nearly all the orthodontists move it back. There's a conflict of interest there somewhere, you should think about it. Um, but the reality is that this boy would have probably had bimaxillary surgery. They had moved his maxilla back a bit, his mandible forward a bit, and I don't think he'd look much better anyway. But I mean, what was wrong? He just had bad posture, and that was a result of his Western lifestyle. Um, it is really just mess things about. But um, this is just after three years um, of improving his um, form, and he's still too d vertical. But um, uh, you can just see how easy it is to change the growth. He now has no overjet. He's, I would wish he was further forward, but um, he may not have room for his wisdoms, but he's certainly got plenty of room for the rest of his teeth, and they're in a nice straight row. Um, and that was in contrast to the forecast of surgery at the age of 18. But it just makes you realize what is possible. Um, I get quite a number of micrognathic cases. All have been told, well, you know, you're, you've been born with a small mandible, tough. You've just got to wait till you're older and we'll chop it up. You know, and that's a very common diagnosis. So if you get, have a patient who has that diagnosis, scout around a bit because there are other solutions. Um, this is the boy in question. Um, and I just thought you'd like to see that, because I mentioned just now, we use a special rate of enlargement to the maxilla. Enlarging the maxilla is necessary if you're treating someone of, say, eight, nine years old, because they've had eight or nine years um, of the maxilla progressively narrowing. And by then, they have a very narrow maxilla. Therefore, you have to take an active step. I was influenced a lot by various different functional um, lecturers, um, um, such as people like Frankel. I'm sure you've heard of Frankel. Frankel um, used to change the oral posture by putting in shields. It was a very effective method, method, and he used to hold the mandible in position with his appliance. The one thing that the frontal appliance didn't do was make the patient keep their mouth shut. And that's the one which I'm afraid most functional appliances fail to achieve. They don't make the patient keep their mouth shut. And I think that's why we're able to get results like this, because this poor boy wore an appliance which forced him to keep his mouth shut for year after year. All day to start with, and just at night after a while. But I'm directing your attention to the um, head-on picture of the maxilla. From the lower picture, you can see the change in shape. But what is really interesting, if you look at the head-on picture, his maxilla was 15 millimeters. Now, in dentistry, that's a hell of a lot. Um, when you read textbooks like um, Bill Prophet, who's a great friend of mine, um, he will say, oh, well, don't expand more than four millimeters. I would think a lot of you probably do expand more than four millimeters, but here we expanded 15 millimeters. And yet, if you look, there is no tilting of the buccal teeth. And my orthodontic colleagues tell me, oh, you can't possibly use a removable appliance to expand the jaw because the teeth tilt. And then they just tilt back afterwards. Well, they don't. Um, uh, and um, I, I think that's a very important message for all of you to pick up. Um, removable appliances are excellent. I think much better than fixed appliances for expanding um, maxillae. Now, some people believe in very slow 
movement, um, uh, like the um, straight, not straight, well, straight wire appliances, um, and also um, uh, um, Armstrong's, um, um, what do you call it, uh, the ALF, um, the ALF appliance. ALF will widen the dental arch. They don't tilt much, but they don't really m m open the um, central um, diastema, the central suture, which of course is necessary if you're really going to get a larger maxilla. But by opening at this particular rate, by this particular method, we expand at one eighth of a millimeter a day. That's a sixteenth of a millimeter on each side. Now that is half the width of the periodontal membrane. Therefore, there is never any risk of crushing or damaging the periodontal membrane. Therefore, it's a very slow, but natural, but progressive opening. Within three months, you've opened the maxilla 10, 12 millimeters. And that is very stable. That's what I found out, partly through experimentation, but just partly from following up cases. If you want to get a stable expansion of the maxilla, expand using that rate with that particular method. If you like, use the particular appliance we use. I don't have a patent on it. Anyone can use it. Um, but you do need to pay very careful attention to the rate that you move it because that is crucial. It not only widens maxilla, but it performs, in my opinion, a much more important to aspect, and that is it moves it forward. So we both widen and move forward the maxilla with this particular rate of opening using this particular appliance. Um, I developed the appliance, I would think, 40 years ago, and I've hardly changed it since. I did that again on the basis of my research. If, the, if you look at the research of <coughs> physically changing bone, the, the, the rate one millimeter a week is the ideal rate. Go faster or slower and different things happen. At one millimeter per week, you will get a natural change, which is really quite stable. Now, I am well aware that during what I'm saying now, I will be treading on the toes, opinions of many of you in this room who are very experienced with the work that you do and have all developed methods that you are comfortable with. I'm only saying think about what I'm saying because I have done it for a long time. I do know the merits. I do know the stability. I actually developed these ideas from my father, who was an orthodontist, practicing one hell of a long time ago. He learned his orthodontics in 1920. And at that time, people would automatically expand any four to five-year-old if they didn't have spacing between their deciduous teeth. That message was known in the 1920s. Somehow it's got forgotten. Nobody does that now, and yet it's such a sensible thing to do. And my father used to do it. I was told in dental school, with some waste of time, the expansion elapses. But my father had kept good records. I went back, uh, he died young, sadly, but he left very good records, and I actually studied them and looked at what had happened. And my um, colleagues were right, a lot of them had relapsed completely. But quite a lot of them had only relapsed partially. And, you know, that means you've got a partial gain in the side of the maxilla. But quite a lot of them have been completely stable. And that was against everything that I've been taught and told. You know, as a young student, when this happens to you, you do suddenly begin to feel um, you know, have I been told the truth? You bring this for me. Yes. Oh, what a nice guy you are. And my knee is feeling a bit sore. I will say, you couldn't put it here, could you? Right. And I can't, am I allowed to move this? No, I'd rather not. We'll fall over. Um, right, that's great. What a thoughtful guy you are. Anyway, um, where had I got to? I was talking about 
the relapse rate that my father had. What was really extraordinary, um, I was actually measuring the um, uh, cases that he'd done. What was really so extraordinary was that some of the cases had gone on widening after it had finished. I think I'm actually... Just a bit louder. Okay. I'm surprised anyone can't hear me, but there we are. Um, <laughs> but I have found quite a few of my father's cases had gone on widening after he'd stopped expanding. Now, you know, some people might just say, well, that's queer, but I'm, I'm one of those cussy people who must know the reason. I say to myself, if something happens, there's a reason for it, and if you don't know the reason, you ought to. And so that really worries me. And if I get posed a question like that, I, I'm just not comfortable until I've worked out what I think the cause is. And I think that's why I've come up with this ridiculous system, because it is ridiculous. It's terribly, incredibly time-consuming. And um, all right, it does a lot, but most children um, won't comply. So is it worth it? That's not something I can answer. Um, that was the, the picture of the teeth. Now, you look at that, most of you will shiver. But basically, what have I done now? I've, his jaw should be like this. But in fact, he was like this. I have to get these teeth, the upper incisors, into the right position. And they should be here. So, what do I do? I push them a long way that way. But also, I measure these and find their way back too. So I do that. And of course, by the time you procline, you'll create an open bite. Now, most orthodontists who see this type of case think it's Ridiculous. You know, from time to time, I have patients transfer from my practice, and of course they go to a proper orthodontist, and the orthodontist is very rude about what I do, and say, you know, he's ruined your dentition, etc., etc., which creates lots of excitement. Never, have, never do I have a dull life. Um, but, I mean, at least... I'm so damn confident that I overcome most of these problems. But um, the reality is, um, in that middle picture, the only teeth that are anywhere near in the right position are the incisors. Unfortunately, the, the rest of his deciduous teeth are all going to fall out. And you may notice I've intruded the molars. So you see the the first, uh, uh, sorry, the six-year-old molars are intruded. So the only contact in that picture there is on the loose, well, the deciduous teeth, which will become loose, and they're all going to fall out. So it's a certain degree of method in my madness, as you might say. Anyway, um, later on, um, that's what happens. It, I'm just giving you an idea of how we practically reduce vertical height. Because most orthodontists will say it's impossible to reduce vertical height. But no, it isn't. Um, it, I don't say it's easy, but you need to think what's gone wrong, why it's gone wrong, and be totally logical about what you do. Too many people do orthodontics by rule of thumb. And I really don't think that's how it should be. It should be done by using your common sense as well as your knowledge to decide what's the right thing to do. Um, don't be worried about that middle picture, but do plan it and be logical about it and don't try and overreach your own experience. But anybody can do that. It's, it's not that skillful it's far more skillful changing the posture afterwards. Um, but I just thought you'd like to have that brief glimpse of what we do, which will also help you to understand why so many conventional clinicians are very much against what we do. They just don't understand it because they are used to the rules that they had themselves. And they don't visualize the anterior teeth as being too far back 
and they from experience know that if you push them forward with fixed appliances, you're likely to push them out of the bone. But of course, we've used removable appliances, we've just tilted them. You might say, well, why is it that the teeth are tilted forward in the middle picture, but upright in the last picture? How did you do that? Did you use fixed appliances? No, I stopped using fixed appliances nearly 40 years ago, and I haven't used them since, ever. None of these cases you'll see have had any fixed appliances whatsoever, and a lot of my colleagues know that I'm very much against fixed appliances. The research shows remarkably clearly that whenever you put on a, a, a set of fixed appliances, the face immediately starts growing vertically. You all know what I mean by that. It just starts growing down, which is the exact opposite of what you want. And that is what fixed appliances do. Um, if you um, can't believe that, just look at the research and look at the mere comparisons of the before and afters, because time and time again, you'll find that the um, after picture will show the teeth beautifully meshing and lovely and straight, but the face will be longer, the cheeks will be flatter. When you actually look at the face carefully, um, you'll think, well, that didn't look as good as it did when they started. I've done research on that. I've treated identical twins. I've a colleague to treat one with fixed appliances. I've treated the other using these silly methods. And um, on every instance, and here I don't want to upset people, but I'm sure I will. In every single instance, there are only 12 twins. Not easy to get identical twins and treat them differently, I can tell you. So there were only 12 but every one of the twins treated with fixed appliances were judged by a panel of 10 judges to look worse after the treatment than before. That was 10 um, non-dentists making the judgment. All 10 thought the faces looked worse after having been corrected with fixed appliances. Um, some of them had extractions, but not all of them. Um, whereas the cases that have been treated with orthotropic appliances, um, all but one look better. That they reckon looked the same, but I know the reason she put on a huge amount of weight. And definitely I was disappointed, but that's one of the things I'd failed on. But I don't want to make this sound too opinionated. I'm very keen on my research. And um, every time I am worried about something, I really deep research it deeply because I want to know the answer, even if I'm not interested in telling all of you. But the research exists. We've done it. We can show it. You can quote it. But um, believe me, fixed appliances damage faces, full stop. Um, uh, and an awful lot of orthodontists know that but they don't really mention it very much, and they certainly don't warn the patients. But that's not my affair. Um, now, I said before, the influence of the tongue, it's, it's not easy to judge where the tongue is. You, the big problem being you can't measure tongue posture. You can, to some extent, measure tongue position, but that's not easy either, because the tiniest sensor in the mouth will disrupt tongue position, posture. Therefore, you're going to get a misleading reading. Um, and as for measuring long-term posture, how do you measure the position of the tongue for a day, yet alone for a week? It, the simple answer is we don't know anything, really, about tongue posture. We can observe. Lots of people talk about tongue thrust. Many of us were brought up to that phrase, tongue thrust. It's a very misleading phrase. It doesn't exist. Basically, what it is, is a tongue in a forward position and contracting against the lips when you swallow. Now, when you swallow, you have to suck. That's the first part of the swallowing reflex. And you suck before you swallow, and then 
you, um, put, you should push your tongue on the palate and move the bolus, as they call it, down your pharynx so that it, the peristaltic wave will start. That's what should happen when you swallow. But nearly all of you in this room um, actually swallow with your tongue sucking on your teeth. Just try it. All right, it, I, it's difficult to judge the proportion. I would think 60, 70 percent of you will. And I'm sure you all realize that when you swallow, you suck on your teeth. Well, that's absolutely wrong. That is why you've got collapsed arches and crowded teeth. It's also why your cheeks are a bit flat and your nose is a bit big. You sucked everything back. And you started doing that very young, all of you. I am being rude, aren't I? But believe me, it's the truth. And I don't think we should hold back on the truth just because it makes some of us uncomfortable. The reality is that all our mid-faces are too far back. I can say this probably more than all of you because mine is probably further back than any of you. But I have a great big long face and I'm as flat as a pancake here and I've got a big nose. And that's simply because I've sucked everything back. Because that's how I swallow. I like to think I've tried to make it better. But when I was a youngster, I left my mouth open all the time. And I don't remember what I did with the tongue, but I don't have the slightest doubt that it was between the teeth. And I know that is the case for a lot of you in this room. I would just say, wake up, realize what you're doing to yourself. Because at any age, Changing your oral posture will make a noticeable difference to your face over the years. So don't think it's too late at any point. When I say noticeable, I'm talking of millimeters, but there will be a difference. Um, and of course, if you do that to a six and eight year old child, you will make a dramatic difference. And I will show you some slides of that. But the reality is all these things are dependent on posture. I did mention a bit about the contact of the teeth. Now, one of the things that I found out when I was digging up bones was that our ancestors used to wear their teeth flat. Do you know all the cusps were worn off within two and a half years of eruption? Absolutely flat on top after two and a half years. And after the age of about 60, certainly on the first molars, the, the, they would be way through the uh, um, enamel, through the primary dentine, and into the secondary dentine. And some of them would have actually worn their teeth level with the gum. Now, they were eating rough, tough, hard food. That's why the teeth wore. It's what happens with animals, certainly all herbivores do this. And after all, we're an omnivore, but we do eat a lot of, um, well, our ancestors did a lot of rough, tough food. And they had to eat huge quantities because the food they were eating had, was very low in calories. They spent, I would think, half, maybe more of their living lives just hunting for food and chewing it, just to keep alive. Anyway, that's why they had such very different shaped jaws to us, massive muscles. But it, it, it is also the reason for all the attrition. Now, many people I find, I mix with um, a lot of orthodontists and clinicians who talk in great detail about the occlusion and how the teeth would mesh perfectly. And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, there shouldn't be any cusps there at all anyway. So whatever you're doing, it may be right or wrong, but it's certainly unnatural. Uh, it, it's just what you think about it, because there are no rules, because animals without cusps, or humans without cusps, didn't exist back in the days of our ancestors. Everybody had flat teeth. Now, the, what therefore you might say are the cusps for? Are they to tear up the meat? I don't think so. I think they are to guide the teeth into their correct position. After all, we must remember that teeth are blind and dumb. They don't know what they're doing. They just push. And um, if the tongue is on one side and the cheeks or lips are on the other side, the teeth will, hey presto, come down. And you know, they'll all be in a nice straight row. Isn't that wonderful? 
No, they had no orthodontists in the caveman era, um, nor did they have any crooked teeth. And yet, in this room, I would say that crooked teeth are endemic, almost universal. I mean, you can straighten them, certainly if you make room, by taking out a few premolars, but they very rarely stay straight. Why is that? Because you've not done anything to correct the tongue of the lips, or at least many people don't. And of course, the teeth are crooked because of the tongue and lips. So we really need to look at the cause and argue. But I did say earlier that if we get all this right, all the problems with sleep apnea, which I know are, bring many of you here today, disappear. You never have it. It doesn't exist. I'm quite sure cavemen never had sleep apnea. And certainly you'll find that by and large, if you look at the people who do have sleep apnea, there are people who've got their faces right back like that. The maxilla is way back. And of course the mandible is even further back. Well, what does that do to the airway? I don't need to tell you, do I? Um, because you all deal with it. Uh, but you, many of you I know, adopt methods which I wouldn't consider relevant to the cause. I think you need to think about what has gone wrong, why it's gone wrong, and then address all of these things because they are addressable. All right, the older the patient, the less you can move the bone. So there are restrictions, but in my opinion, and here this is just my opinion, that you should be able to stop anybody with sleep apnea just by giving them a small amount of forward movement on the maxilla and making them keep their mouth shut. I think that would stop all sleep apnea. Now, you know the field. It's not my field. Um, uh, I, I find people who have sleep apnea problems troublesome, shall I use that word. I don't enjoy treating them very much. Um, but there we are, you I know and your bread and butter from them. But do bear in mind what I've said, because I'm pretty sure of my facts on this issue. I would be delighted to make, have a little discussion afterwards, because um, I think it would benefit all of us. Now, I must get on with these few slides, or if you won't have time, time for anything. But let's just, this is a very interesting case. Michael, you'll remember this case. This was a chap who came to me because he'd got a really messed up dentition. He, had, he was a wealthy man, and a very good looking man, actually. Um, and he had that dentition, and he went to um, an orthodontist I know well in England and said, I don't like my dentition, it's too narrow. Um, so the orthodontist said, don't worry, I can fix it. Well, he fixed it and put on the treatment. Now, you may not notice, I can look because I know what to look for, but he has a slight open bite posteriorly. I don't know if you can see that now. It's not severe. But he's got a nice straight teeth, a slightly wider arch, but he's got a lack of occlusion posteriorly. Now, I don't know what that would mean to you, but to me, it would only mean one thing. His tongue is inside between his teeth. I look at the first picture and I say, why is that upper arch so narrow? You know my answer would be because it, the tongue's not, in, not up inside it. So if you mess around, certainly with fixed appliances, what are you going to do to the tongue posture? Are you going to improve it or worsen it? Maybe one, maybe the other, but often you'll worsen it. And that type of patient will then develop a tongue between posterior teeth, maybe be between any teeth, but anyway, a tongue between tooth posture. Now, again, within this room, there are many of you who hardly ever bring your teeth into contact just when you're eating, and you rest your tongue between your teeth, long term. That's where it is, and all of you will have a degree of malocclusion. Um, I know that just from the ratios. Um, but this chap had been precipitated into a tongue between tooth 
position. He didn't like that result. I think he wasn't comfortable because he felt all his bite was on his front teeth. Well, I, I, I empathize with him. So he decided he'd go to the best orthodontist in Europe, who happened to be in Germany at the time. So he went all over for a regular cycle of um, different fixed appliances by this expert, who I also, I, I know most people in my old age, uh, who treated him um, to make his dentition much better. And they made the dentition much better, there's no doubt about it. Unfortunately, they didn't get the, the posterior teeth to me. They're beautifully straight. Um, and at this point, the, this famous orthodontist said, well, I don't know what to do for you. You've got an aberrant growth pattern. Your, your jaws aren't growing properly. There's nothing we can do for you. So uh, knowing that I was a bit of a way out crunk, he came to see me. Um, to me, it's absolutely obvious what has happened, and I think the other side showed. See how this is well-intentioned orthodontist completely messing up an occlusion because they haven't any idea what the tongue does. That was purely caused by the tongue on each side. And um, it really worries me that there are so many people in the world like that, or so many orthodontists. You can imagine why they don't approve of me, because I criticize what they do. But I think it needs to be said, you need to look out for a situation like that. If you've got a patient whose posterior teeth aren't meeting, you need to ask yourself why. You, if you have patients who've had fixed orthodontics, they've come into you and you look in their mouth and find they don't have good interdigitation. You know, individual teeth aren't meeting. Well, teeth do meet, they meet automatically. Every tooth meets automatically. If ever you see an open bite anywhere, there's only one reason. It's because something's obstructing the teeth from erupting. And usually, I think nearly always, that's because the patient is keeping the tongue between the teeth. It shouldn't be there. Um, you need to be able to recognize that situation at the top in advance so that you don't finish up with the situation at the bottom, which is very difficult to correct. You've got to get the tongue out of there. And how the hell do you do that? It's not easy. I know, because I've, I've been tested on that point very often. But I really did want to bring some of these points across to you. Um, yes? What? He committed suicide because of that problem. Oh, well, right. Um, Michael's reminding me. He finished up by committing suicide. Well, poor devil, I'm, I'm thinking he'd really been messed around, and I think it was the maltreatment by the orthodontist that had caused it. There we are. Now, the airway, I know this is what <laughs> a lot of you are interested in. Uh, so, there we are. Um, now, I was, because I'm curious, I got involved in the airway one hell of a long time ago. I don't know, uh, I, this is, uh, the must be papers were written before this. Um, doesn't put the date up, does it? Oh, yes, it does. Um, 83. Were many of you involved in s sleep apnea before 1983? Not yours. Hmm? That's not your date, that's McNamara. No, 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 I know it is. That's, but that's when I wrote the paper. That's the paper I wrote this article in. And I just the same, facial form, head posture, and the protection of the pharyngeal space. That's what it's called. And I would go on to say the children who learn facial development tilt their heads back to remain, maintain their pharyngeal head. They do this. That opens up the airway. But of course it messes up the facial growth. And disproportionate facial growth is to some extent disguised by backward tilting of the head, which maintains the facial plane while emitting major adaptive changes to occur in other parts of the cranium. Now, if I turn my head sideways to you, you'll see I've got a slightly sloping forehead. Not bad. My forehead should be upright, like that. But now I put my, up, my head upright, my jaw shouldn't be here, it should be here. That's what's happened. Um, 
that really happens to so many people. But people don't diagnose it because I move my head back like that. And you think I've got a just straight face, it just happens to be a bit long. In actual fact, I'm tilting my head back, I have a curved neck posture, I've got a hump in my shoulders, and I'm a mess. But um, the, the reality is, it's very simple. And I have in my mind, or shall I say in my conceit, I know, I have no doubt that that is what um, a restricted airway is about. And if you can correct the growth, certainly in a young child, you'll cure it forever. If you can get it to your children at the age of five, six, eight, you won't just correct the problem, you'll cure the problem. You'll cure not just the crooked teeth, you'll find room for 32 teeth, you'll eliminate all airway problems, you'll eliminate all TMD problems. What are TMD problems caused by? Everything being too far back. Would anyone disagree with me? Um, I mean, all right, if you take everything forward, you just, you don't just cure it, you prevent it. It will never happen. Nobody with a really good forward-looking face will have TMD. You'll find some people with nice square-looking faces have TMD. But if you look at their dentition, there's not room for the wisdom teeth, and there's often a bit of crowding. So, so you know, nothing simple. But um, now, this is what you need to do to a face. Um, all right, you can see at age seven, he's got no room for the lateral type. Well, there's a millimetre and a half there to fit the lateral incisor in. And I mean, you could get it in if you took out the deciduous canine, but then where would the permanent canine go? So, with also topics, we just take everything forward, upper and lower, and, um, you know, you don't notice much difference in the teeth, do you? All right, there's more space, but everything else looks more or less the same. Um, but have a look at the length of the face, the forward growth, because that's what you've got to get if you're going to cure any of the problems that I know you're all interested in. Horizontal growth is a must. Vertical growth is terrible. I've got it, I know. Um, this is, again, a boy only nine years old. A um, little bit late for me. But, I mean, just look at the mess. He was also told he had micrognathia, was going to need surgery. And um, that was him 14 months later. You know, all right, the teeth are still a mess, but at least the space now, isn't there? And then I think this is him five years later. All right, no, the teeth aren't perfect. I mean, if I put that in at an orthodontic case, um, it would be turned down, people would say, well, the spacing there, the teeth aren't perfectly positioned, that lateral isn't fully rotated. But, look at the face. And the fact that he'd been told he needed surgery at 18, and he, he obviously doesn't need any surgery at all. So, this is purely changing the pattern of growth. Really, it's converting a vertical growth to horizontal growth. And to me, that is one objective that every orthodontist should have. And I honestly don't think you need to do much else. If you can change vertical growth to horizontal growth, the teeth will look after themselves. They'll straighten themselves, position themselves. You don't need fixed appliances. Don't think that makes it any easier, because to achieve a, light, a result like that, you might think, well, five years, that's um, a long time to treat. Um, I mean, most orthodontists would say it was a ridiculous time to treat. But what are your objectives? Are you trying to improve the child with the realization that later on they may relapse or go back a bit? Or do you want to cure their problem forever? That's what I think my job is. Now, I know that boy now will never have problems with malocclusion. I'm sure his wisdom teeth will erupt without any difficulty. And yet, he was told he would need um, surgery. Um, now, this is another case. A girl at 15, really uh, towards the age of what you can achieve. Um, 
That was after 18 months. Now, we've done a lot of skeletal correction, but her face still doesn't look right, does it? I'm sure you'll all agree. Do you know why? Can any of you recognize why that face doesn't look quite right? I'll save you down. She doesn't have a natural lip seal. People with natural lip seal look heaps better. And so I just went, I'm a persistent devil. I went on and on and on at her about her lips. And eventually she got the message. And she came in quite recently looking like that. You can see the teeth are still not perfectly interdigitated, are they? Why is that? She's still keeping her tongue partially between her teeth. But you can see the facial improvement. Look, interestingly, at how her head posture has changed. In the two previous treatments, or photographs, she's leaning her head forward. But when we finish, she uprights her spine. And that makes a difference to other bits of the body. This is a boy I saw years ago, 14 Milanova jet. That's a lot. And waiting for surgeons. Um, so I did, did that in three months. And do you know, I thought that, well, that's remarkable. I should publish that as a paper. And guess what? They refused to publish it because they said it couldn't be true. <laughs> well, there we are. Maybe it couldn't be. So um, this is what he looked like, what, 15 years later. All right, he doesn't look quite so good looking, but his teeth are still in the same position and the mandible never went back. So, you know, you do need to stick to your guns. I mean, this is a really nasty malocclusion. Um, big overjet and a real tangle of the teeth. So I treated her, it took what, um, five years. And um, she was a good patient. But she then phoned me up to say, oh, I'm a little bit worried about my teeth. I said, oh, help. But she was by then, I think, 31. And she said, I, a little space has developed between the two front ones. But, I mean, when you actually look at the change and the permanence, maybe um, this is a patient worrying about not very much. I did close it for her, but I told her she'd have to get her tongue right for it to stay. Um, right, I do enjoy every now and again tackling impossible cases. I know I'm not really going to succeed, but I like to try. Now, don't you agree this is a pretty impossible case? A massive um, deviation to the right, a huge anterior open bite, and a very distorted face. I actually looked at him, and that was him at the age of eight, him at the age of 11, him at the age of 15. So it, something's gone wrong. It wasn't there all the time. So I decided to sit down and correct it. Um, I expanded it. I then moved the mandible to one side. I mean, what upsets me is that I'm told by my orthodontic colleagues, you can't do that. It's not possible to move the mandible to one side. You have to have surgery, full stop. There isn't any other way. That's nonsense. You can move mandibles to one side. You can do almost anything. And I've got it more or less in the middle. All right. I'm still left with a big open bite. Um, I saw him two, three weeks ago, and uh, the open bite's now down to uh, two and a quarter millimeters. But he's still keeping his tongue too far. When he talks, you can see his tongue like this all the time. And he knows what the problem is. I know what the problem is. His mother knows what the problem is. It's his tongue. But I do hope that in the end, I'll get it shut because he's a persistent devil, and I told him if he doesn't get it tut, shut, he's likely to have instability in the future. But I mean, they're setting challenges. This is, look, there's a canine erupting behind the central. Now, you might say, what's the hope for the canine? Yet alone, what's the hope for the central? I mean, that's a pretty severe impaction, and the dentist hadn't even noticed it. Um, and when he did notice it, sent him to a plastic surgery unit, and they said only surgery could correct that. Most of you in the room, I think, would say, well, yes, you need surgery for that. But I said, no, I don't think so. I think I can do it without any surgery. Wait and see. So I just um, treated him, and um, 
This was him, what, a month and a bit ago. Um, since then, I, at, that, at that point, the upper canine is occluding just inside the lower canine. It's now crossed over, and I said to him, that canine will be down in position by Christmas. And I'm sure it will be. You can notice also the change in his facial shape. And it's just orthotropic, it's just expanding up a jaw, teaching him to keep his mouth shut. All right, we pushed a few teeth around here and there. But there's no magic to this. It's common sense and very simple. Uh, we did a survey of all the patients in the practice. And we found that in the past five years, not one of our patients who came to see us had developed an impacted wisdom teeth. On the national average, about 150 should have impacted, developed. Impacted so... Impacted canine. Hmm? Canine. Yes, did I say? Yes, it right, I'm always saying the wrong things. Don't worry, thank you. Um, anyway, so uh, but I know that you can avoid every single impacted canine in the world simply by doing this treatment at the right time. It, 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 there wasn't one impacted canine. And I know the struggle that all of you in the room would have when you damn well have canines that get impacted. I mean, it really disrupts your practicing life. You rush them off for surgery and one thing or another. And then all you have to do is just widen their upper jaw, procline their incisors, and the canines will come in. Believe me, write to me if you want to ask me about it. But, um, you know, it is fun to um, do really impossible cases. Right now, I'm, I say, they're always telling me that things aren't possible. Remember the tropic premise. Just read it, remember it, and never ever forget it, because it is the one and only total truth about orthodontics. Right. Um, those are just a selection of recent faces. Um, I, you know, one of the things you can look is the length of time that the cases are stable. When I say stable, we give absolute, I don't give any retention on any of my cases. Absolutely none. All right, we treat them for an extended period, but we give no retention whatsoever. And we say to the patient, if you maintain the tropic premise, it's going to be stable forever. Right, um, I did just want to show you this because it is a problem and I should have shown it at a slightly, I'm just going to go quickly. These are just people saying, don't, um, uh, well, they're saying the risk of moving with fixed appliances. This is why he was treated with four put traction and got a lovely result, look at that, very nice. They then decided, oh, well, it wasn't quite right. We'll straighten the teeth up. And um, lo and behold, all right, the teeth look better, but look at the face. It's damaged it. And that shows a picture down below. And then this is, an, uh, this is um, the time position of Brown, who's in the audience. This is a case where he got a really nice result. It was. Look at that. Um, the the growth direction of Pogonian was 58 degrees. And uh, he then um, finished with fixed appliances, and I do have his permission to show this picture, and the, it really started to grow vertically, really quite steeply. But that's what fixed appliances do. This isn't a do sometimes, this is do always. And that's why I never use fixed appliances. I don't think they're a good thing to use. It's a, a naive approach that an orthodontist had a long time ago, that it's easier to move the teeth to the exact position you want if you glue a bracket on and pull it with flexible wire. It is easier. It does get straight teeth, but you need to extract more often and it's not stable. Um, this is a similar thing, Darren Ward, who I'd hoped would be here, but Sally isn't. That was the girl before treatment, the girl after orthotropics. And then um, she broke her plants, so he fitted a, a Maya brace. And all right, Maya braces, I think, have many assets and advantages, but they don't 
support the mouth and the posture in a situation like this. You need oral myology to do that. The brace, the mouth brace itself doesn't do it. It doesn't keep the mouth shut. Um, and I think I've probably said enough by now. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. This is Joe. I have my failures. This is why I did that. Beautiful. I said, continue to wear your appliance at night. He said, no, I like what I've got, and that's good enough. I don't want to wear an appliance anymore. And so out of interest, I got him back four years later, and that's how he looked. You know, you, you, it is a long-term thing, training, changing posture. I think I've said enough. Um, and, um, oh, I see a friend in the wings. Um, good to see you, Bill. Right. Thank you. Do you want that? Thirty, 35 years ago this weekend, I started a continuing education saga. Prior to that, I thought I knew everything. Uh, but I, I started to travel to, to find different ways to do orthotics. Uh, it was a very uh, uncomfortable time. Uh, it took me nine years until I finally met John. And when I met him in 1990, it all came together. Uh, literally changed my life. I, I, I enjoy listening to him every time. Uh, I learn something every time. And I thank, I thank him for being here and thank him for the influence in my life and the influence in all of your lives. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Yes, lovely, much obliged. Thanks, all of you.